Is, uh, originally our plan for today was to have one of our social ministry speakers come in, uh, and that was going to be the folks from Project Return. Uh, that's the ministry of Cross Lutheran that began in the 80s uh, that helps uh, people who have been in prison kind of back and to do a kind of a re-entry uh, plan with them. Um, we misscheduled them, um, which is totally our fault, uh, but we wanted to lift them up, and we thought a good way to honor them uh, was to, to engage in, in walking through the webinar uh, that Bishop Eaton, as well as uh, other ELC leaders, helped facilitate uh, earlier this winter. Uh, it's about racism, but through the lens of the criminal justice system. There is an ELCA social statement called Hearing the Cries. It's about uh, the criminal justice system on all sorts of levels. Um, you can get copies of that online. I've got a few in my office. Um, if you haven't also looked at the ELCA social statement on racism, it's called Race, Community, and Culture. Uh, it's also a good uh, read if that's something that, that interests you. Uh, but for the most part today, we're going to engage with the material uh, here. Uh, I've watched it before. It's, I think, really uh, informative and insightful, and it doesn't need any other introduction. So thanks for being here and for watching, and let's pray the technology works. <laughs> And welcome to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America's live webcast, Confronting Racism, A Holy Yearning. I'm your host, Bill Horn, and I'm a member of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Clearwater, Florida. Joining me is ELCA Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, and together we would like to introduce three ELCA members who will be joining us for a conversation. A warm welcome to Yolanda Tanner, Lenny Duncan, Shara Giuliani. We are gathered this evening at Edison Park Lutheran Church and ELCA congregation in Chicago. And we'd like to express our gratitude to the congregation for their gracious hospitality. Let us begin our time together with prayer. Liz, will you lead us? Let us pray. Lord, listen to your children praying. We ask that you would be in our speaking and in our listening. This church dares to confront racism because we have our life in you, and nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Racism remains an enduring crisis in the United States. Along with many faith groups across the country, the ELCA has named racism a sin. Racism is a mix of power, privilege, and prejudice. In the life of our church, we proclaim Jesus Christ and the confidence this good news brings to set us all free from the captivity of racism. In the life of our church, we continue to work for the end of discrimination of all kinds. This evening in particular, we commit ourselves to addressing the complexities and implications of racism in the context of our criminal justice system. In this church's social statement, the church and criminal justice hearing the cries, the ELCA affirms the fundamental principles of the United States criminal justice system, such as due process of law. Yet this church joins its voice with many others who yearn to challenge grave deficiencies in the current system. You're now seeing on the screen a vivid illustration of the racial disparity in the criminal justice system. This depicts why we are here. The ELCA gives thanks for those who serve in law enforcement for the common good. Federal, state, county and local law enforcement officers daily confront troubles ranging from murder to domestic violence to traffic offenses. The ELCA recognizes that those who serve regularly encounter complex and stressful situations that take a toll on their lives and relationships. The church gives thanks for the judicial system that is intended to operate with impartiality and accuracy in handling offenses 
while also structured to provide legal protection against errors or overreach by the state. The ELCA does not presume to have quick or easy prescriptions for the extensive and enduring deficiencies of the system. However, the cries of the people, the obvious injustices, and the data all shape an urgent yearning for change in the criminal justice system with a special concern for addressing racism in that system. Our fellow church members and friends gathered here have experiences or careers in the criminal justice system. Yolanda, Lenny, and Shar, we welcome you once again. And at this time, may I invite you to share your story with us. Um, thanks, Bill. So, I am an ELC member. I'm a member of uh, Temple Lutheran Church in Hammertown, PA. And I am also a student at the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. And I think I'm technically, as of yesterday, also a student of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Gettysburg. Like, good announcement, uh, good news in the life of the seminary. Um, and um, I, my life was a mess. <laughs> You know, we were talking about that earlier. My life was a mess. Um, I grew up in West Philadelphia, a 63rd in race. Um, I am, um, both my parents met and fell in love in a drug rehab. And I sort of, you know, um, sort of started um, uh, three steps behind everyone else. You know, we were, I was a product of an interracial marriage and a very racially tense time in Philadelphia. Um, by the time I was 12 or 13, um, my parents' addiction had really taken off, and I decided to uh, to leave home, basically. And I spent most of my years, from 13 years old to about, I'd say, 22, 23, homeless. Um, and I was faced with some choices. Um, sell my body or sell drugs. Um, basically any way I could survive. And you know, and there were times in my life where I had to do both, you know, as, as, as a young child. Um, and of course, when you're living that kind of life, you're living on the streets, you don't have anyone around you, you don't have the kind of background, context, and upbringing to do um, better. For a lot of socioeconomic reasons, um, <clears throat> you end up running into the law a lot. You end up running into the police a lot. And so I started this tour of county jails across the country. And it was the same cycle over and over again. I would get arrested. It would be my first time being arrested in that state. They would give me OR, which is, um, for those of you who have never been arrested, that, that means you're released on your own reconnaissance, um, with the promise that I would show up to court. I, that I had been homeless for 10 years. I couldn't even show up anywhere in life, you know, um, you wouldn't know, I wouldn't know where I'd be from one minute to the next. So then I would get a warrant out for my arrest. Next time I come back to that state, I'm traveling through, doing whatever, I would get rearrested. This time I can't get bail, even though I can never afford bail anyway. Um, and, and now I have to sit for months at a time, waiting for, you know, to take a, a, a deal that was offered to me by the DA. The DA would offer me a deal, I would accept anything, and accept any felony on my record just to get out. And there was a lot of reasons behind that. Um, first, I, you know, I was suffering from alcoholism at the time. I just wanted to get out to get a drink. Or I knew I would never show up for court anyway. Or this idea that I was kind of worthless. And that it wouldn't matter if I showed up. That no way I would make it. That I was just one of those people who had fallen through the cracks in society and um, was sort of really didn't expect to live for a long time. Um, what happened to me is uh, about 2010, after some experiences with, uh, um, about 2010 with some experiences, you know, um, trying to get sober, um, I heard a voice. The voice said, you're getting sober today, and that's not really the grace of God. The grace of God for me is that I believed it. And I sort of just followed that, and that eventually that, 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 that that Holy Spirit, that movement, led me to a call to ministry and wanting to preach to my people, wanting to share with my people, people who are like me, who want what we have to offer, but uh, don't feel they're worthy. Yeah. So. 
Okay, I'll start where, where I am now. Um, I'm, um, believe it or not, a seminarian at Workburg Seminary in Dubuque. Um, and um, if you would have told me when I retired seven years ago from the police department as a police sergeant that I would have been in seminary, I would have told you that you were crazy. Um, so um, it, it, it's a really interesting story. My dad was a, um, a police officer and I followed in his footsteps. Um, I was on the job for 25 years and then I had the opportunity to retire and I retired right away because uh, my wife and I were able to um, foster and adopt uh, twin boys. Uh, when, we, when they first entered our home, they were three months old. Um, we adopted them when they were two, and um, now they are 10. Um, and they are just an awesome blessing. Um, so I retired um, with toddlers, and uh, St. Stephen the Martyr Lutheran Church thought that, you know, working with the youth is where I should be, so they asked me, and um, I said yes, um, and they said that uh, you're only going to need about an hour a month to hang with the youth, you know, and just council meeting. Uh, well, it turned out to be more, more than that. Um, I thought if I'm going to be with the youth, I need to get to know them. So I joined them at a Bible camp, and um, they changed my life. Um, they really had an effect on me. I pulled in the driveway with the boys. Um, in the truck, Shelly wasn't able to come along with me. She approached the truck and said, you've changed. And I told her, um, yeah, we need to talk. Um, so then that's where my education started. Um, working in law enforcement, um, I, I got to experience a whole bunch of different things. And um, it was um, quite interesting. But one thing I need to share is that there are so many good officers out there. They try to do the right thing. Um, they're good officers, they're Christian officers. I just talked to one the other day, and um, to paint everyone, when one person makes a mistake with a broad brush is just not a way to begin the conversation. Um, law enforcement officers have asked me, where's my church? And I said, good question. Um, because they, you know, it, it's very important that we do share um, um, the voices who don't have a voice. We need to speak up for them, um, but we also need to stand up for when officers are being um, shot and killed. We need to say, wait, this is not what we believe in. This is not how we're going to do this. Um, so it, it's really important that we understand things like that. Um, one thing that um, our, our twin boys are African American, and um, we see the injustice in this country. We, we see it happening. Um, our boys are 10. In six years, they could be pulled over um, for whatever reason. They could be arrested. Um, our boys could live this. And I'm here to try and say, we need to change. We need to change. Every morning I see them, and I, and I see what needs to be done. And every, every night when we put them in bed, it's like, we, we have to make a change. Um, and we see this when they're little, you know, they're being treated differently because of the color of their skin. We're at a water park and, and they're being treated um, differently. And um, it's just, you know, we were um, at a gym the other day and um, some uh, young men were at the, at the counter and they were being refused a, a membership or a membership card and they were African American. And um, Shelly looked at me and she said, that's not going to happen to our boys, is it? And I said, if this doesn't change, it will. And so, um, so we, we need to address this. But we need to also understand that we have good law enforcement officers out there all the time. And these good law enforcement officers may have to make a choice that we may not be happy with. Um, but, you know, um, just recently there were 44, I believe, uh, recruit officers sworn in. <laughs> knowing what's going on in this country they're not they're not uh, becoming police officers to take advantage of people they see that we need to make a change we need to be here for people we need to protect and serve everyone so yolanda um, i'm yolanda i serve as a trial judge in baltimore city so i hear all sorts of cases i'm um, sitting in a felony trial docket, and I'm a cradle Lutheran. 
Um, my first experience with racism, however, happened right after my confirmation when I was 13. Um, I had an opportunity to go to a boarding school. I walked into my room, and my roommate's mother looked at me and said, under no circumstances is my child roaming with a black person. And that was my first really in-your-face experience with it. Um, we wound up being roommates. I can't say that we were good friends, but we weren't enemies. <laughs> um, years later, as an attorney, um, after I had a few years of experience, I was um, hired in the law division of an agency. And there were actually two of us hired the same day, myself and a white man. And there was a salary range. And when I discussed salary, um, the agency said, well, you don't have experience with our agency, so you have to start at base. He was hired with no experience at that agency, and he started at the top of the pay scale the same day I did. And when I asked about it, they said, ah, oh, but he has instant credibility. Mm -hmm. Well, while they didn't use race, that's how I certainly interpreted it. Um, and it just, it was the subtle but in-your-face nature of it. I worked really hard, however, and two years later, I was running that unit. Ah, the unit that he was in, so I became his supervisor. Um, but it just really let me know that um, it's, it's all people of color who face the challenge in our nation. Um, it's not just one econ economic strata of our society that faces it. And so as a trial judge um, in Baltimore, which is a majority minority city, I see lots and lots of African Americans on my docket, not exclusively, but a lot of them. And, it's always a challenge for me not to perpetuate institutional racism in my job, but to protect the due process rights of the defendants who are before me, um, to judge fairly, um, and to sentence appropriately. And, and that's the challenge for me. Really powerful stories, thank you for sharing. Um, for those of you watching, um, we're gonna take a break now, about two minutes. But we want to hear from you, so if you could please share your questions at hashtag ELCA Confront Racism, we'd really be happy to look at those. And during this two-minute break, uh, resist the temptation to run to the refrigerator because we have a YouTube video about work that's being done in the South Carolina Senate for people to come together to talk about the reality of racism. See you pretty soon. Welcome back. I, I think we're all warmed up now, so let's continue our conversation. I've got something I'm, I'm wondering about. Um, we Lutherans like to be um, a people in a church of paradox. We talk about being saint and sinner. We talk about law and gospel. Uh, we talk about being bound and free at the same time. But listening to all of your stories and how you are living out your baptismal vocation, uh, you two in seminary uh, for public ministry in the church, you on the bench, um, but also your experiences with race and, and the justice system in this country, it, it just seems that your lives are a kind of a paradox. I mean, you're, you're, um, the, the tough way you came, you came up, uh, getting caught in the system, but somehow God reaching and pulling you out of that, and now you're saying, I'm going to be a part of this church, which is 95% white. And you being a, a, law, a police sergeant, walking the beat, having a, a, a your, your, you and your partner breaking up fights, um, and seeing the, the danger and the good, but also understanding that your sons, in some way, might be uh, must be careful when dealing with law enforcement, and the, the experiences that you had. I'm so glad that you got to be the supervisor. That was a good story. Um, but then you're you're seeing um, African American uh, men, usually young men, coming before the court and trying to mete out justice that, that's, that is, in fact, justice. How do you negotiate that? How do you live in this paradox? Um, well, I guess for me, um, for me, for one thing, I think I've been talking about this a lot. I'm everyone's starter black, right? <laughs> so I feel like that's part of my calling. I feel like I'm particularly called to the ELCA at this time. Uh -huh. um, and in a lot of ways, I think we need to embrace the fact that we, or at least face facts, that we're a 95% white denomination, uh -huh. European descent. So when other people see a challenge with that, I see 3.5 million potential allies on the fight for racial equality. Uh -huh. That a serious reading of the gospel and the life 
of Jesus Christ leads one to believe that you should fight for the marginalized, you should fight for the poor, you should fight for those who are who 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 are really suffering the most in the system that we're in. So for me, I see these 3.5 million allies, and so I feel like I'm specifically called to speak into that context as a person of color. And um, when I say person of color, I mean someone who's not European descent. Um, and that's why I'm here, and I feel like that's part of my calling. Yes, it's hard. Um, one of my first days on campus, I was sharing with you earlier, um, someone asked me if I was related to the only other person of color who was starting that year. We're the only two people, is that your sister? Now, I know he was just trying to relate to me, and I, I had no ill will towards him, but running up against that kind of stuff, um, you're called in dark times to be the light, you know, that you want to see. Um, and I don't think it's a mistake that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm called to ministry at this time in this particular church in this denomination. Um, and one other point, I, you know, if we are a 95% white denomination, then we have to deal with the fact that things like Dylan Roof is one of our own. Yeah. It was one of our own murdering two of our own. And what does that say about us? And what does it mean for the ELCA to wrestle with that? Um, and if we are going to repent for the sin of racism and systemic racism and systems that create situations like we saw in Charleston, uh -huh. then who better to do that than a mostly white denomination? I mean, we're the ones who have to wrestle with it. We're the ones in positions of privilege and power my brothers and sisters in Christ in this denomination. So for me, it's a whole lot of that stuff. If that's the tension I sort of run into and the challenge I'm like so happy to accept. I'm so happy, you know, I, yes, it gets tiring to explaining that stuff to some of my white peers over and over and over again. But I also know that it's, it's also, I get to do that. Like that's the gift Christ nice. gave me. I get to do that. And I get to be someone with this voice in these times. When I wrote that letter to the church right after the Charleston um, 9, I had, I had written that one of our own is alleged to have um, killed two who adopted us as their own, Reverend Pinkney and Reverend Simmons, and I was accused of only being concerned because Lutherans were involved, mm -hmm. which is not the case. So I was trying to make this very same point, that we can't pretend that this is an issue that happens outside of the ELCA. Mm -hmm. It is us. So, yeah, thanks. Um, my answer to that question, um, it's, it's amazing to work with the individuals that I got to work with. Um, they're great people. Um, and to be honest with you, I never saw law enforcement being a law enforcement officer as a vocation. Oh. And um, I, as I look back and I see how God was working through my life, um, high school and you would have told me I would be um, talking to people in public and, 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 and being a voice for someone, I would have said no because I was very shy, believe it or not. Um, I was very shy, uh, but I now as I look back, I see how God was working through the police department to get me to where I needed to be. And um, I mean, it, I had to talk on the police radio and broadcast things. And then I became a dispatcher and I was able to talk to hundreds of people at one time. And even though I was behind the radio, it loosened me up a little bit. And next thing you know, as I was training and I got involved in the um, diversity program at, um, in the police department. And um, so, so it just kind of, um, it just snowballed from there. and. You know, um, and, and people need to be careful uh, about what they ask for. Um, I uh, dropped the boys off at school uh, one morning, and um, I was art, uh, I was struggling with what I was supposed to do. And I was having a conversation um, with God in the truck. I'm going, what do you want me to do? There's social media. Use it. Next thing you know, my Facebook goes off, and there's a notification that says, a little birdie told me that you're interested in the work for DL program, this distributed learning program. If you have any questions, please call me. And I was like, OK, God, got it. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I'm going to be contacting Workberg. Um, so, um, and that's when I filled out the application and everything. And it's just amazing how you look back and you're able to see how God works through us. We, you know, they, God, the Holy Spirit works through you and puts you through things and, and is there with you, holding you up, and you don't get it until later on. And you're like, okay, now I get it. 
now I get it. And um, when we had the opportunity to meet the boys and adopt them, um, we, th we were planning on a toddler, mm -hmm. um, and we had two infants, and, um, and we tell them they were born into our hearts, uh, and um, they like hearing that story. But, um, so, I mean, it's just amazing, and now here I am trying to help change things, and, um, and now I have a personal, I mean, there, there is something personal now. I need, I want our children to grow up to be um, awesome uh, adult males um, that doesn't have to worry about when they're walking down the street or, um, you know, what they're holding in their hand, that type of thing, so. I heard a rabbi once uh, explain uh, or interpret why Moses could only see God when God was walking away. And his interpretation was that sometimes only after the fact do we realize that God has been there. And that sounds like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I play a balancing role almost every day at work, mm -hmm. um, particularly on the criminal docket, of um, listening to police officers testify about why they believe what they did was reasonable and appropriate. Um, listening to defense attorneys argue why they believe that it was not. Sometimes listening to other witnesses about what, and then just applying the law to the facts that are there. Um, I don't want to be the instrument to just railroad innocent people um, into incarceration. Mm -hmm. And um, But when there's a victim, I also owe a, a duty of fairness to the victim and their family as well. So it is a real balancing act. For me, one of the real challenges, however, is in sentencing. Someone asked me not too long ago, do I believe in a second chance? And I do believe that probation is a second chance. It's an opportunity not to be in jail. But probation really assumes that other systems in your life are in good place, yeah. that you, you have a home to live in, um, that you're able to report as you need to, um, that you won't be arrested for another crime, you know, that you won't move without getting permission, you won't leave the state, um, things that are often challenges for people who have poor educational histories, little or no work histories, um, housing challenges, who need to move on a regular basis. So unfortunately, there are a lot of people who aren't successful on probation. And I don't speak for the judiciary in the state of Maryland. I don't speak for anyone but myself. But really, we have two choices, incarceration or probation. Um, and, you know, the theory of incarceration or the theory of sentencing for us is that it's either a deterrent or it's a punishment, and sometimes it's a mixture of both, but that it's not reform. So I need community-based programs to support people because our criminal justice system is not a reform system. And that's the real paradox for me. Um, so it is listening to people hearing what they have to say, hear what their families have to say, and coming up what I think is best, both for them and for society. And that's the real challenge for me. So all three of you have had front row seats in the criminal justice system. Um, what would, if you, if, if you had all the power in the world, if, if you had won the Powerball uh, this, this day, yesterday, what would you like to see in our criminal justice system? You, you said one thing would be some, some community-based. Absolutely, because whether you are leaving a period of incarceration or trying to survive without make, making it to incarceration, if you don't have a job and you don't have job skills, then you need to gain them someplace. Um, particularly for those people who are leaving um, a period of incarceration, they often have no place to go. Um, no job lined up, no housing lined up, mentoring, a, a community that supports you, a community that supports your family while you're away, saying, well, while you're in a job training program, we can provide daycare for your children, or we can help you with food, or there's someone who, it doesn't have to be a glamorous job, it can be a barber or a truck driver or something that says, let me mentor you, you know, in a way to, to show you something that you can do that keeps you from being incarcerated. And unfortunately, um, the availability of really cheap guns on our city streets is a real problem um, because when you don't have anything else, then, you know, thefts, armed robberies is where a lot of people turn just to make it for themselves. And that winds up putting them in that revolving door of the criminal justice system. So I'd really like to see our congregations adopt one or two 
on people who've had contact with the criminal justice system and really try to support them in their efforts to turn their lives around. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think my answer kind of falls in line with, uh, with, with, with Yolanda's, <laughs> you know, the problem is, is that we, when you walk out into the community and, 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 and you have no discernible skills, and then all of a sudden you're stigmatized for being a felon for the rest of your life. Um, and, and I'll give an example. Um, uh, as part of the process to become a, a leader in this church, I have to do clinical pastoral education, which means I spend three months in a hospital really, you know, duh, um, really doing um, um, uh, uh, the work escaping me right now. But, you know, doing the work of being a pastor and, um, and a chaplain inside the hospital, that's the word I was looking for. And I got interviewed for it and, and, and at the one facility, and they loved me. And I was very honest with my story. And I was very honest, you have to write an essay and you know, your life story and your biography. And I told them everything. You know, a big part of my ministry is my past. And exactly what you were talking about. That, you know, um, with with Christ my story makes total sense. You know, it's a great story. Without Christ, it's like a a capricious God just playing with me, you know? And and so I you know, I know I was very forward with that. And they didn't want me to interview with anyone else. They begged me not to. And I said, fine. I did that. And maybe about four weeks ago, I get an email. We're sorry, we can't have you because you're a felon. Mm -hmm. Even though I had been honest about it. Now, to be clear, and I have no shame saying this, this is a 1998 drug felony. You know? Mm -hmm. I sold a couple hits of LSD at a concert in 1998. It's 2016, and clearly I'm living a slightly different life. <laughs> And I'm unable to take this this position because of because of the laws that are in place. So it's that branding. It's it's you know it's almost like being and I hate to use this terminology. I'm sure I'll get some heat for it. It's like being a runaway slave or something. You just you are branded for life. You and, and that's who you are, no matter what you do. So I'd really like to see some reform with that. Some reform of how we treat felons post incarceration. Why can't they vote? Why, why aren't they good enough to work with you? Why aren't they good enough to sit on a jury? You know, don't, don't you think a petty crook would know another petty crook when he saw one? <laughs> so <laughs> that's the frustrating stuff for me. If I had all the power, I, I think the stigma, the, the stigma that sticks with someone who's clearly trying to be a better part of the community, uh -huh. that's the stuff that really rankles me. Not because it affects me personally, because I see it affect all kinds of people. Uh -huh. well, let, me, let me thank you for an insightful, <coughs> honest, <coughs> enriching conversation. So viewers, what questions do you have for us? While we take another short break, this is your opportunity to send a question that you would like us to answer. Again, send your question on Twitter at hashtag ELCA Confront Racism or on the ELCA's Facebook page at facebook.com. some kind of conversation between um, law enforcement and the community. I think we're really losing that, um, that opportunity. And years ago, I was walking the beat with my partner, and we were in a grocery store. And now th th this was just amazing. I mean, my partner's African-American, and um, we've been down to talk to this uh, young, young boy. I think he was like four or five. And um, the gentleman that was with him, so don't talk to them, they have a bullet with your name on it. And I think we, we really need to get together and talk about this because you know what? We don't have bullets with people's names on it. That, 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 is, uh, that is not what is happening. And um, I think conversation needs to start. We need to start somewhere. And, um, and with the $4 we want in Powerball, I'd like to start something. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Char. All right, our first question was submitted by email and comes from Pastor Cornelius Eddy from the Emanuel Lutheran Church in South Philadelphia. Although I do not see the, did not see the first webcast, I would like to know 
what the church is doing about racism within the church as a pastor of color the answer to this question is very important to me i appreciate all that you are doing and continue to do one thing is that we are continuing the conversation that we started um, last year and in this conversation we as a church are actually naming that we are we are a place where systemic and institutional racism really exists mm -hmm. and we understand that we're saint and sinner too but for us i think at least for me uh, and other colleagues for us to name this that we are not exempt from racism in the elca is an important first step but it's only a first step um i i i think the first thing we need to do is we need to start um up lifting these voices but you know of of, of persons of color within the church um, and, and we need to, we were talking about this earlier, we need to call these pastors wherever, you know. I'm not specifically called to a community of color. I am called to the community of Christ. I'm called to the body of Christ. I have gifts to offer, whether it's Iowa or West Philadelphia. And so for me, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's one big thing, you know. And, and, and the second thing is, is a lot of my colleagues at the seminary, particularly at seminaries that are in urban areas, it's a great opportunity to, to really expose yourself to communities of color and really start to get to know who some of these elders are, specific, specifically people in the African descent, you know, Lutheran ministry and, and, and association and all those people, and really learn and sit at their feet. So you can go back, you know, we're training the leaders, and the future leaders of the church. So why wouldn't you want to get to know people of color and community of colors? Mm -hmm. Because you'll be affecting the hearts and minds of, of entire congregations. So, um, you know, particularly training even our white, you know, leaders, it's not just the role of people of color. Um, it's, 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 it's everyone's role as, as a pastor or a leader in this church. Mm -hmm. And the way our call process works is that uh, bishops and bishop staffs do recommend uh, candidates to a congregation, but it's the congregation who calls. And it probably is time for us in all of our congregations, but particularly our European American congregations, to say, what is preventing for us from calling someone who might not be from our ethnic group, but who has the gifts for ministry, mm -hmm. who believes that he or she is called to the body of Christ or the whole church? And that's that's going to be a difficult thing for congregations to say, we are reluctant to call a person of color. They used to say that about women. They still do. Yeah. <laughs> I think, think you all know that I'm a city manager. And my organization is about 1,600 employees, and I just I, the point I want to make is that when we experience racism within our organization, we make sure that the organization has an awareness of it and what we have done and what we're trying to do to make sure that we don't continue having uh, that kind of impact within our own organization. And I, I really think as we think about our church, I think we ought to benefit from the experience that we're having throughout our church and share those experiences so our congregational members broaden their awareness of what racism is, what form it has taken, how we all contribute to it. And, uh, and I think we, we've got a big church. I mean, we've got 65 cents. We stretch from one end of the country to the other. We have different contexts. But racism runs through it all. And, uh, and, and I think we can benefit from that. I, I think it's important that we, we talk about the call process. Um, our congregation just went through the call process and you have to, you do a self-study and then, then you have to look ahead. Where do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we're, we're so comfortable in our little box that we don't want to look outside that box. And we need to look out the walls and we need to, um, we need to go, okay, where, where can we um, change things? Let's, let's look outside the box. And if somebody doesn't look like what we look like, so what? If they, can, if they preach the gospel, if they, if they um, show us who Christ is, that's you know, like you were saying, you know, if I preach Christ, I should be able to go anywhere that, you know, I, you know, I don't want to say fit in, but you know, where, where I can be called. And, and as congregations, we need to say, you know what, it's okay if somebody has a different skin color than, mm -hmm. than me, you know? So um, I think that would be the, the step in the right direction. Well, all right, let's go to our, our next question. It's from uh, Jackie McDonald from Bethesda Lutheran Church in Eugene, Oregon. 
at a recent meeting with parishioners discussing our joys and concerns and dreams for 2016, a woman of color spoke up about our membership's lack of diversity. Is it true our congregation lacks in this area? Do other congregations have tips that can be shared? Well, I think we came down uh, pretty close to the bottom in diversity, the Pew, the Pew study recently. And uh, I had a chance to meet with other heads of communion, and I met with uh, the man who is the, uh, he's the uh, president of the Evangelical Covenant Church, which is a Swedish denomination that's not very old, and one-third of their congregations and members are people, among communities of color, people of color. And they're, they were Swedes too, so how, how is it that they've been able to figure this out? I wonder, I wonder about that. I know some of the work that we are doing um, with new, new starts, new congregations being started, is that we've made a commitment that at least half of those will be um, started amongst communities of color, people who don't identify as white, um, and also uh, people in poverty. But then the question becomes, how do we support those congregations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but other thoughts? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I always suggest that if you're in a if, if if you're in a really white church, in a really white context, I guarantee there's a drug corner in your town, and I guarantee that if you went there in that particular community at 5:30 on Friday and had a prayer vigil, not interfering with the drug trade, not no signs telling them what they're doing is wrong, you do a couple things. One thing, you get people outside the church, and they realize that the people in the community that may not look like them. Or may not talk like them or act like them or people too. You also send a signal to the community, hey, we care and we see what's going on. And and then the last piece is is, is is that you start showing people that you've got skin in the game in this town. You've got skin in the in the game in this particular congregation. So many of our congregations are sur surrounded by communities yeah. of color, mm -hmm. but they're afraid to walk outside for whatever reason. Maybe they're not afraid, they just don't know how. Start showing up. Start showing some skin in the game. Something happens. You're outraged by it. It's okay. Go be outraged. Uh -huh. You know, Jesus has Jesus got angry too. Uh -huh. It's okay to be angry and to show that in, in really loving ways that, that sort of invite the community. Hey, that old church down the street, they care. They care that my kid has to walk past these three drug dealers on his way home from school every day. Let's go to our third question. Bruce Sheely from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Columbia, South Carolina asks, Statistics indicate that violent crime is significantly more predominant per capita among the black population than among other races and ethnic groups. This also contributes to a higher incarceration rate due to the related sentences. What factors contribute to this? How can this be reversed? Well, I don't speak for all of the judiciary, but I don't know that the rates of crime are higher among um, communities of color than they are upon white communities. But what I do know is that people in communities of color don't benefit from prosecutorial discretion in terms of deciding not to charge or deciding to divert. Um, and they often don't benefit from favorable dispositions like probation before judgment or an expungement of the record because they don't have the supporting systems around to make them a good candidate for that. Um, there are lots of specialty courts that are emerging all across the country, whether they're drug courts or veterans courts or um, any other court that really is aimed at what puts you where you are now. But oftentimes, people in the communities of color don't get the benefit of those referrals. And so the only thing that's left for them is incarceration, whereas they're not offered the same thing. So I would actually challenge that the rate is higher, but the incarceration of people of color is higher than of other people. And we saw that in the, in the graphic that we showed earlier uh, in, when we started. Well, let's, uh, let's take a question from uh, social media. Uh, first one is, how can white Lutherans become allies and confront racism <coughs> without perpetuating cycles of white privilege? This is from Andrew Tucker. That's a great question. Um, and if we, um, I'll uh, speak for this white person, if we can stop seeing um, people of color as somehow instruments either to um, assuage our own um, discomfort with the privilege, or somehow if we have, it's like the, what was the 
the Coca-Cola commercial where everyone was in a wonderful flowery field and we're all multicultural. If we could, we've got to stop instrumentalizing um, people and not say them and us. Mm. Um, and we had this marvelous sermon at, um, at the Churchwide Center on, on Wednesday in, in chapel and uh, it was talking about uh, uh, our identity in Christ and the, the preacher happened to point out that, that race is a made-up con con construct. It's baptism that's real. And if we're saying that we're baptized, then that is our identity, first and foremost. And so, and, and, and if, should we invite someone to our church? Well, it's not our church, it's Jesus' church. And then we expect them to be just exactly like us, meaning the, the majority um, members of the congregation, how is that making someone feel that their life, their their uh, their experiences, um, their piety is being valued? If we're just going to make them into carbon copies of us, mm -hmm. that, that's got to be something to take a look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think accompanying people who are facing challenging times, um, if no one will speak up for you, then there's no voice to be heard mm -hmm. through the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So really accompanying people through the process of being willing to be a resource for them, um, just being willing to take a risk and supporting people, I would say, is something that the church needs to do. Mm -hmm. it, and I think that's important. Um, we need to start a conversation first. to be Before we can be supportive, you know, talk talk to people. You know, um, if, we, if we want to be supportive, we can't say, you know, this is what you need if I don't talk to you yeah. first. Mm -hmm. We, we have to have conversation, and that uh, everything starts with conversation. And when you start pigeonholing people, okay. then, then the conversation is us and them, like you said, but we have to remember we are all baptized, you know, Christians. Mm -hmm. for, for my allies, I just, you, you got to know that, that your struggle, my struggle is your struggle. Uh -huh. that, that, that this battle is for the soul of this country right now and for this church and it you and we will all pay terrible terrible consequences so the first thing is just to realize that there are gifts already present in communities of color we don't need you to add gifts to us we need you to recognize our gifts hear our voice and walk beside us walk beside us take some risk you know the um we were, i said this earlier they hung jesus from a tree it's not safe to be a Christian. I know that someone in your congregation may get mad. I know someone might tear down your Black Lives Matter sign out front of your parish. I know that you might take heat from your colleagues. I get it. But being a, being a Christian isn't safe. And you have to realize, just like it's not safe for me to walk in certain neighborhoods as, as a black man. It's not, it's not safe to be a Christian. And, 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 and a little bit of that, you know, get some skin in the game. I think so. And that's, that's it's so, it's so true. It's just racism does not affect one group and not the other. And if our understanding of the church as the body of Christ, that means the entire body of Christ is bound by racism in, in many ways. And you know, we hold up what St. Paul mentions to us, says to us, is that, that Jesus is our peace, who has made us both one, who has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. And we know that that's true, but we see that in, in, in actuality, in, on this side of heaven, that it's not that and that, I think that provokes a holy yearning in our church. Let's take another question. How can the church help leaders of color who are discriminated against in their own churches and their own offices? You're all looking at me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's real. <laughs> I think that's a fair, recognize that it's real, that these things are happening, and they're not happening in the distant past, they're not happening at a synod far away from you, they're happening in your home synod, and they're happening with people you probably know. To recognize that they're real, and lift up those voices, and take a look at what part of complicity, what, how are you complicit in that? And to realize that, that the pervasive evil of racism is oppression for all of us. Like it, it oppresses the church, and, 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 and the voices, as, 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 as my local bishop says, you know, the voices of the marginalized, they're really going to stretch the church into the future, and so raising those voices up. I think my brothers and sister bishops, they are trying to be uh, more um, guided with congregation, so if congregation refuses to take a candidate for color who's clearly 
um, qualified. We have some bishops that say, well, then we're just going to wait for a while and think that over and pray about it. Mm. But that doesn't always happen. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And it really is the mentality of scarcity. Mm. You know, as opposed to the generosity of God, that God loves and cares for each and every one of us, and that there's room at the table for each and every one of us, as opposed to there are limited seats and I can't give up my seat if there's some pass. Good. I think you'll think you'll like this next question. Are we going to talk about encouraging our congregations to discuss Black Lives Matter and it isn't about politics, Marie Marie? If it's not about politics. It's about life and death. Right. <laughs> I, I just don't know how you can take a serious reading of the gospel, of any look at the New Testament, and not want to cry out for the voice of, for, for the oppressed. God is a God of the oppressed. And it's, it, 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 it baffles me. It baffles me that, 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 that we can't talk about the sanctity of life in that context. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not political, or maybe it is political. Jesus was pretty political if we look at some of the things he said. Mm -hmm. I mean, or the fact that he took the exact same title as the emperor, or any of the other stuff that we can get into from the gospel. But it, it's hard to have a public theology and to be a public church without it being perceived as political. Mm -hmm. And if you want uh, uh, and if you want a leader who's going to stay away from things that are political, then you, you want a leader who's not talking about the gospel. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's not who we are. But I think the point that, 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 that we made, and I know in our last webcast, we have to have the courage to confront that what is most uncomfortable. It has to start there. And how many times have we talked about pastors who were reluctant, I mean, just as one example, to have conversations within their congregation about things that really matter to them, things that... That, that are, are threatening unity within the congregation. I mean, just, just think about that. But, but as we talk about racism, it's a difficult conversation, no matter what context it is. Uh, and, uh, and that it, and it's going to continue to be, you know, until we live out what God has told us to do. All right, one last question. What ch ch challenges does the ELCA face in increasing the diversity of our church? Stephen Rye. So we, we've done a move so slightly, but I, I think I think our congregational polity stands in the way in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so we, at, at the church-wide office, your staff, um, we are intentionally, and not, I don't want to hear people whining about the quota system, but we're intentionally looking beyond the, the usual suspects to people who are qualified and gifted and faithful who might not necessarily be European American, and we're doing that at the church-wide office. But then we go out around the church, and our congregations and synods are overwhelmingly white. So how do we how do we provoke in all of us this sense that 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 God has blessed us, as you said, a God of abundance, that there are rich gifts, that uh, communities of color are not somehow always the clients or the needy, but here are gifts to strengthen the entire body. And then how do we? I'll give cover to our pastors right now if you want. You, it's hard for you to have these conversations in your congregation, so people will react. Well, blame it on me. We need to start talking. And lay people, support your pastors. Thank you once again, ELC members and viewers, for submitting your thoughtful questions. As we near the end of our time together in this live webcast, where do we go from here? Our commitment to confronting racism does not end here. Liz. Mm, thank you. Well, thanks, Bill. Um, Yes, one webcast or one call for a conversation about race in our church and society will not address this reality. We must continue our work as a church of more than 3.7 million members, even when some other issue has grabbed the headlines. While this webcast serves as a way to keep the conversation going and provides an opportunity for members and congregations to go deeper in our listening and in building relationship, we must commit to looking for ways to continue the conversation in our own congregations and communities. We have the resources. You can check at elca.org slash webcast, and we will list the resources that we have. If some of you, in fact, at the first break, watched the video about what's happening in South Carolina, you could try that in your own home territory. We have criminal justice statement, as well as uh, the, the study guide uh, that says, it's called Call to Hear. Use that, but it's not gonna work if we don't, if you don't, if all of us, 
don't see that we are inextricably bound to each other. And as Paul says, when one member suffers, all suffer. And when one rejoices, all rejoice. When we can see that our story is the same, is, is intertwined with everyone else's story, and more to the point, that it's God's story for us, then I think we might see not only the urgency, but the beauty and the holiness of this moment in time. Why can't the ELCA be the church that models for the rest of this country what it means to have these difficult conversations and trusting in our baptism, also believe and understand that we will never be snatched from Christ's hand. I challenge us to do that. Thank you, Liz. And a special thanks to Char, Lenny, and Yolanda. We also thank, once again, the Edison Park Lutheran Church for your gracious hospitality. And we also thank you, our viewers. May I also invite you to conclude our time together with prayer. I'd be glad to. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you showed compassion to the centurion whose servant was sick and to the criminal on the cross. You work through these people, through law enforcement, through the judiciary, through, through our justice system. But you also work through those who have experienced the cries, who utter the cries. We pray that you'd use this church to be a, a beacon of hope and to work for the shalom, the peace, the justice that you so desire. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are at our time. Any closing parting thoughts? Done. Yeah, um, I've been listening to some of the uh, debates of candidates for president, and it was not um, Donald Trump who made the remark, I believe it was Ted Cruz, <clears throat> who, and I don't, I can't uh, exactly quote him, but the remark inferred that they need to consider people of color because they aren't as smart as the whites. I've heard this for years and years and years, and there are people who are ignorant of the fact that a study was done about 25 years ago to determine. Now, how do you determine who is intelligent and who isn't amongst people of all cultures, of all European, African, South American, and the determined, determining factor was how many PhDs per capita? That was the only thing that they could determine. And what they determined with Russians, Polish, Germans, French, Spanish, and Africa was that the Ibu people of Nigeria had more PhDs per capita than anyone else. So people of color are just as smart, some of them not. Some white people aren't as smart. It depends on the gifts that you're given by God, but you cannot specifically point to any one cultural, race, sub-race, or subculture as being smarter than someone else. And that's, I had to say that because I, I did not like to hear the comment by someone running for president of the United States. I thought it was, he was way off base and uh, just ignorant of the facts. It names that race is a social construct, so it's, it's, it's self-created. We've made it this way. And education is connected to funding and, and schools and housing and real estate and and food and yeah you name it so it's it's a systemic thing absolutely um, we're at time uh, but hopefully that was <coughs> provocative and whet your appetite um, there are more resources than the other uh, other conversations that are online through the ELCA YouTube page as well. And we'll continue our conversation of race and church and culture uh, kind of on a monthly basis. <laughs> and, um, and thanks for being here. Go in peace. Thank you.